um, to give the Rolf Cotter lecture this year. Um, meeting Rolf and, and uh, reading his papers is one of the highlights of the earliest part of my uh, career in, um, in brain connectivity. So I wanted to kind of reflect on that for a moment. Um, back in the day from 2004 to 2009, I was at King's College at the University of Cambridge um, working on my PhD with Ed Bullmore. And I vividly remember reading and rereading and reading and rereading these papers from Rolf, including this one, the network participation indices characterizing component roles for information processing in neural networks. Um, I used the Cocoa Mac database um, and absolutely loved this uh, database methodology for the collation of connectivity from uh, the macaque brain. Computational analysis of functional connectivity between areas of primate cerebral cortex. Um, and this one, motifs uh, in brain networks. As I was reading these papers, I was struck um, by this view of the brain as something that is not just composed of individual regions, but where the pattern of connections between regions becomes so incredibly important. And that refocusing that Rolf and others helped us to do um, on the pattern of connections in neural systems did at least two things. It certainly pushed conceptual boundaries for us in the field. Um, and it also opened up some really amazing opportunities to use the emerging mathematics in graph theory um, and network science. And I wanted to focus on network science as a sort of more generalizable form um, uh, of graph theory and, and why what it is and what it offers to our study of the brain. So first, I think it's really important to note that network science is a very flexible framework that's applicable to many different data types and to testing diverse hypotheses. It also provides a wealth of statistical tools, algorithms, and theories that have been developed in other fields, so mathematics, physics, engineering, and computer science. But at its core, the network science provides a modeling approach for the brain. It is not a pure representation of the brain. It, it produces a model of the brain. And I think it's important for us to remember um, then that network science is a modeling endeavor. It has a couple of assumptions that go along with it. The first, for example, is that you can separate the system into cleanly delineated units. The second assumption is that you can define the most salient relations or connections between units. And then the third assumption is that from the structure of that connectivity pattern that you can derive, you can learn something about the system's organization, make educated guesses about its function, and build models of its development, growth, and evolution. And I think over the last um, two decades, what has happened is that we've begun to ask the question more and more deeply of how to assess the efficacy and the merit of network models. So yes, we can build them, but how do we know um, when they are um, efficacious and have merit? Well, I think there are multiple answers to that question and that um, the validity of any particular network model will depend on the goals of its use and the domains of its application. But even allowing for that uh, diversity, I think that there are at least three kinds of validity that network models can have um, and that the field has been assessing steadily over the last few years. The first and simplest is what I call descriptive validity. So descriptive validity addresses the question of whether the model resembles in some key ways the system that it is constructed to model. Descriptive validity aligns with questions about how well the specific pattern of nodes and edges matches the anatomical and or functional data that it represents. If the pattern matches the data, then you have strong descriptive validity. But describing a system is, is never sort of the end goal um, of science. I think that often what we wish for is something that moves beyond description towards explanation. So the second type of validity that I think is important to think about in the context of network models is explanatory validity. Explanatory validity focuses on a theoretical construct used to develop statistical tests and support conclusions that are drawn from the use of the model. It addresses whether a network's architecture can be justified from data and used to test for causal relations to dynamics or to behavior. So it moves beyond a descriptive validity in explaining um, the uh, dynamics or behavior that we observe. 
But I want to make uh, another distinction beyond just the distinction between descriptive and explanatory validity and make a distinction between explanatory validity and predictive validity. So predictive validity occurs when there is a correspondence between the organism and the model in their response to a perturbation, such as a drug, electrical or chemical stimulation, neurofeedback or training. When there's a correspondence between how the organism responds to an intervention and how the model responds to an intervention, then we have predictive validity. These three types of validity can be pursued independently from one another in different studies, or they can be pursued in series in the same study. But with validated models, we can ask, you know, what are the questions that are most pressing for us as a field? And I think we ask questions in several domains, but I wanted to start by the fact that we ask different sorts of questions about network computation than we did before we began to focus on patterns of connections. So instead of thinking about computation as something that an individual unit performs in the neural system, we now think about computation as a collective um, activity that multiple units uh, perform together with one another in concert with their pattern of connections. I think we also think very differently about network development than we did before. So we think not just about how a piece of the brain may change in its uh, cortical thickness or in its gray matter volume or in some other feature of um, the tissue. Rather, we think beyond that to also understanding how the pattern of connections changes as the organism develops. We also think very differently about pathology. Um, instead of thinking only about how single pieces of the brain may be altered or have aberrant um, pathophysiology, we now think more about how there, are, there is a constellation of brain regions and their pattern of connections that accompany certain neurological disorders um, and psychiatric disorders. And we also think very differently about network intervention. So rather than thinking about um, intervening on the system by probing one particular piece of the brain or of a neural system or of a neural circuit, we now think about network interventions. How do we intervene on the whole network, perhaps by multiple points of intervention to change the whole system to move towards um, a particular more healthy uh, set of dynamics? So I want to take a brief moment here to think about what those network inter interventions are and how we can build a theory for them. Um, and this is an area that I'm particularly excited about and um, that I have been uh, working with my uh, students and colleagues to sort of build out um, over the last couple of years. So I'm excited to have an opportunity to discuss it with you here today. So what is a network intervention and how can we build a theory for it? I think that, again, there are multiple answers to that question. And I'm certainly somebody who believes that it's important to bring multiple methods to bear on emerging questions in the field um, and to value different approaches. However, one approach um, that I think is particularly exciting among those is network control theory. And network control theory is a mathematical framework that determines which perturbations can drive the whole system to a desired state. So here's an example system where we have individual units that are connected with a particular pattern of connections. We can envision an intervention, this um, B1, where where a control input is injected into a particular region, and that may drive a change in the activation of the units inside of the system, such that the system initially existed in an initial state, noted here as this green dot, um, but after the intervention, the system would exist in a different final state of activity, indicated by this latter green dot. So network control theory is typically applied um, outside of neuroscience. So to the study of the power grid, to mechanical systems, to air traffic control systems, to robotics, et cetera. But I think that this approach is very interesting and useful in the context of the brain. So let's think about network control theory for neural systems. What would that mean? Well, what we can do is that we can define a trajectory of a neural system to be the temporal path that the system traverses through a diverse set of states where a state is defined as the magnitude of neurophysiological activity across brain regions at a single time point. 
So here on the right hand side, I have an example where you may have a brain with a particular activation state initially, here activation of motor cortex, and a final state or desired final state, here activation of um, visual cortex noted in this royal purple. And then what, how we think about network control is that the system would exist at a particular point and then be pushed toward the target state by some um, external input. Then in this particular context, the controllability of a network refers to the possibility to manipulate network components to drive the system along this desired trajectory. That is a set of states all along this line culminating in a particular target state, which may be chosen for its functional utility. And here I want to ask the question of how control theory might differ from communication models. So the goal of communication models is to capture the evolution of communication dynamics by using dynamical models um, and to characterize the process of signal propagation using graph theoretical or statistical measures. By contrast, the goal of control theory is to determine the control strategies that would navigate the whole system or a part of the system from an initial state to a desired final state. So what are the inputs and outputs of network control theory? Well, the inputs are a mapping of the network and a model of the dynamics. And then the outputs are the design of particular perturbations. So let's unpack this for a second. What is a mapping of the network? For humans, a mapping of the network can be derived from diffusion tractography, where we can map out the pattern of white matter tracks across the brain that allow signals uh, to be, that, that can be traversed by um, electrical signals and by information. If instead we're thinking about the macaque or the mouse, perhaps we would use track tracing to map the network or electron microscopy in cellular level circuits. Each of these are different ways of map mapping the network for different sorts of systems and for different organisms. What about the second input, the model of dynamics? Again, here there are several answers and it depends on the goals of the work. So, the models can vary in complexity from something very simple, like a linear time invariant model, to um, fully nonlinear models. The linear time invariant model is one where we say that the state of the brain, x at time t, is equal to the state of the brain in the previous moment times the pattern of connections. So A is the adjacency matrix here, which captures the map of the network. And then plus this latter term, u of t is the control input, which is injected into particular regions defined along the diagonal of the B matrix. We can also have time varying models where the adjacency matrix also changes. So the pattern of connections between regions along which the signals are, are moving can change. And I think um, in this context, a lot about effective connectivity. So using effective connectivity and its alteration over time can provide us with a linear time varying model. Fully nonlinear models are also possible to use in the context of network control theory, although the calculations and, and um, statistics that have been developed for these linear versions um, are, are, are broader and more diverse than they are for the nonlinear models at the moment. So I think there's uh, more work to be done to expand into that space. So I noted that network control theory um, has two inputs, a mapping of the network and a model of the dynamics, um, but it also has several outputs uh, that all circle around the design of perturbations. What are some of those outputs? Well, the first is the impulse response. So that's a system's output when presented with a very brief input signal. Think of sort of pinging the network and seeing what activity changes. That's distinct from the controlled response, which is sort of the second kind of output that you can get from network control theory, where the system's response um, to some controlling input is provided from some particular initial state. So it's not just a ping, but it's actually an input that is designed to push the system in a particular trajectory. The third output would be achieving a desired state transition, as I've illustrated here on the right-hand side um, pictorially. The fourth would be controllability. So as I noted earlier, a system is controllable if there's a control input that brings the system from any initial state to any final state in finite time. 
And then finally, we can calculate something called the minimal energy control, where we design a particular control input U to minimize the control energy and possibly other factors to drive a particular response. So that's distinct from the controlled response in that there's a particular set of constraints that we can uh, place in this ladder output. But all of these ask the question of how the pattern of connections in the brain changes the set of states through which, or affects or constrains the set of states through which the brain can move or can be moved by external inputs. The question spaces that the field is currently tackling include several, and I'm just mentioning four here. This is not meant to be an exhaustive list. But the first would be modeling cognitive control, so an internal control mechanism as a network control process. This um, would include assessments of executive function and dysfunction, as well as its development. It, also relevant here are studies of energy landscape modulation by drug versus placebo. The second set of questions uses network control to better understand the functional consequences of altered brain structure in disease states, for example, in epilepsy, bipolar, or schizophrenia. Also relevant here are assessments of the heritability of network control statistics. The third set of questions is in the space of using network control to better understand brain dynamics in response to tasks, for example, rest versus visual processing, working memory, or brain computer interface control. Also relevant here in this space are studies probing control energy as a marker of cognitive effort. And the fourth and final section that I wanted to mention is the set of questions that use network control to understand the brain response to stimulation, for example, transcranial magnetic stimulation and grid stimulation in epilepsy. Relevant here are studies that design personalized stimulation paradigms that take into account the structural connectivity of the network. So across these sorts of studies, um, including those on network computation, development, pathology, and network intervention, um, the network models that have been developed have typically been applied to the scale of brain regions in a human or of um, neural uh, units uh, in, a, in a circuit. And I want to ask the question of where the field has expanded to since. I think that the field is moving to beyond um, that focus on regional networks to uh, both down to smaller levels of the neural system and out to larger levels. So first, large scale brain activity provides a relatively coarse grained encoding of neural processes and the map from cellular dynamics beneath it up to the regional dynamics reflects the rules of system function. And we're really interested in understanding what those rules are. So we ask the questions of how do cellular processes shape circuit behavior? This is in a sense, a multi-scale or multi-layer or multiplex network question. It is how does the network, it focuses on how the network at the cellular level helps us to understand the network um, dynamics at the regional level. But moving from regions down to cells is not the only um, transition that I think has developed over the last few years, but also moving even further down to molecular networks. So understanding how molecular me mechanisms affect these large scale brain network function is critical for the development of effective pharmacological interventions. So increasingly studies are asking, how do genetic material and epigenetic drivers shape the circuit behavior across spatial scales? And again, moving in this way is really a movement of, of multi-scale, multi-layer, or multiplex networks. But moving down in scale is not the only way that the field has gone. It has also moved up in scale through to social networks. So while the brain activity and structure um, in a single human offers biological mechanisms for that human's behaviors, social networks offer external inducers and modulators of those behaviors. So we can increasingly ask questions like, how do brains shape social networks? And how do social ties between us shape our brains? So with that thinking a little bit more broadly and into the field of social networks, I want to pause here and ask the question of how we could take 
the lens that Rolf Cotter brought to neural systems and apply it to neuroscience as a field. So what I focused on over the last few minutes is the fact that Cotter really brought um, to the fore an important focus on the pattern of connections between neural units. Um, and I want to ask the question of whether that same lens that he brought to the field could be used to understand how we do science um, together with one another. So how is our field perhaps like a network? And how might that be important? Or why might that be important? Can and should we intervene on this network? To what new state might it be pushed? And how would that be important? So to make this a little bit more concrete, I want to think about moving from brain regions to brain people. That's us. So from networks of neurons to networks of neuroscientists. And I want to separate out on the left hand side the questions we've just been asking and on the right hand side the questions that I want to pr push us to ask. So on the left hand side we study networks where individual nodes might encode particular brain regions and then the edges would reflect the connectivity between brain regions. By doing this, we push beyond the question of is the brain composed of independent units and say, no, it's not composed of independent units, it's composed of interconnected units. And that pattern of connections really matters for how the system functions. Now I want to ask the question of what if we took this network and instead had individual people on uh, the network and then had the edges be the citations from one author to another author. This citation network is one that reflects the way that we do science, the way that we encode science, the way that we engage with the scientific ideas of one another. And this type of network can help us to push beyond the question of, is our field composed of um, and our work done by independent scholars? No, we're not independent from one another. We share ideas with one another. We build on each other's um, findings and discoveries. Um, and we push the field forward collectively in, in sort of communion with one another. So I want to think about these citation networks and how they define our field and how they could define our field differently in the future. And I wanted to mention some work by Dr. Sarah Ahmed, who thinks about citations as what she calls academic bricks. And they're academic bricks in two different ways. First, they are the basic building blocks of academic careers in the sense that they determine often to some degree the success of a person, the compensation that that scholar is provided with, whether that scholar is promoted and by how much. Um, citations also impact whether somebody is awarded a grant or other funding awards. It also determines collaborative opportunities and speaking in invitations to some degree. So in these senses, um, citations are building blocks of academic careers, but they're also academic bricks in a second sense. They are the basic building blocks of our field of inquiry. So they may map out our scholarly fields and they define the space of inquiry that we engage in with one another. They also determine the scope of questions that we consider and serve as a record of the history of our scientific ideas in the field. So as academic bricks then, citations can build a more diverse scientific community or can erect walls of exclusion. So I wanted to show, show you some data of citation networks that suggest that there are walls of exclusion that are erected here. So this is a study of over 60,000 articles in the top five neuroscience journals from 1995 to 2019. And what we did is that we assessed whether papers from um, white authors or from authors of color were oversighted or undersighted in comparison to um, the number of such papers in our field. So here along the y axis is the percent over and under citation. The zero mark would mean that those papers from those authors are being cited um, in line with what we would expect, get, uh, assuming race and ethnicity was not a factor in citation. So in, in, in other words, that paper is being cited in a way that makes sense, given the date of publication, the impact factor of the journal that it's published in, the seniority of the first and last authors, whether the paper was a review article or an empirical article, and several other factors. So that would be the zero mark. If papers are being cited above that mark, that means they're oversighted, in and oversighted uh, in a way that is captured by race and ethnicity. 
And if they're be below the zero mark, it means they're being cited in a way um, that is captured by race and ethnicity, but not these other um, factors of the paper itself. So what you can see from these data, oh, sorry, and along the x-axis is the um, race or ethnicity of the first and last author. So this first bin is where the paper has a white first author and a white last author. And the last uh, section here is where the first author is an author of color and the last author is an author of color. So what you can see is that papers from white authors are oversighted by 7.9% and papers from authors of color are undersighted by 17.2%. Very interestingly and troublingly, we show that this imbalance um, is largely driven by the citation practices of white authors like me um, and is increasing over time, even as the field is diversifying. We can do the same kind of study with gender instead of race and ethnicity. And this paper was published um, in 2020. What we did was study, again, over 60,000 articles from the top five neuroscience journals. What you can see along the y-axis is the percent over and under citation. And then along the x-axis is the predicted gender of the first and last authors. Again, after the effect holds after accounting for the date of publication, journals, um, seniority of the first and last authors, whether the paper was a review article or an empirical art article, and after removing self citations. What you can see is that the papers that have a predicted man in the first and last author position are oversighted significantly, whereas the papers that have a predicted woman in the last first and in the first and last author position are undersighted by about 30%. Again, what's very um, troubling here is that this particular uh, citation disparity is increasing over time, even as the field is diversifying, um, and it's also largely driven by the majority gender. I wanted to put those two pieces of information together with one another on the same plot so that we can see how intersectionality might play a role here. So here we have um, along the y-axis, the first author of the paper, their um, predicted race and ethnicity and their predicted gender. And then along the x-axis, we have the last author. The color indicates the degree of overcitation in red or undercitation in dark blue. What you can see clearly is a block diagonal structure where the top left block is mostly red and the top or the bottom right block is mostly blue. That is the gender effect. So on the top left, we have papers with a predicted um, man as first and last author. And in the bottom right, we have the papers that are led by women. Um, what you can see then even within these blocks is the effect of race and ethnicity. And I'll just pull out the endpoints so that you can see um, that those effects. So the papers that are most oversighted are those where there's a white man in the predicted first and last author um, position. And then on the bottom right, you see um, the lowest numbers, uh, minus 47% is a paper that has a predicted black woman in the first and last position. So that's a disparity of over 70 percentage points, which as you can imagine, can have a big impact on um, the success of the individual. Again, these effects are largely driven by the majority race and majority gender and are increasing with time. So I wanted to ask the question of what factors might explain these citation disparities? And there's a there are a couple really simple explanations um, that are very easy to address. So I think that that's the good news. The first factor explaining citation disparities is citing like it's 1995. So the gender proportions of the field today are not reflected in reference lists. We tend to cite in a way that uh, reflects the gender proportions that were true in 1995, but we know our fields are changing and increasing in diversity and our citations are not yet reflecting those changes. So um, that's an important factor. The second one is that there's notable gender imbalance in the co-authorship uh, network. So who we co-author with is um, imbalanced in the sense that there's gender homophily. So a person of a particular gender tends to co-author with other people of that gender more so than expected if people were to randomly mix. And that imbalance partially explains the gender imbalance in author citation behaviors. Interestingly, there's also notable racial and ethnic segregation in co-authorship networks, and that segregation is 
increasing with time despite greater field-wide collaboration. So in other words, per people of a particular race or ethnicity are tending to co-author more with other people of that same race and ethnicity than they did in 1995. So this racial segregation is growing. Um, so what can we do about it? Number one, we can educate ourselves about the work of our younger colleagues so we don't cite like it's 1995. Um, and number two, we can consider expanding our co-authorship network and citing outside of our co-authorship networks. What are some other factors that might explain these citation disparities? Well, there are three others that I wanted to mention. One is citing outside our subfield and doing that a little bit more carefully. So citations are more imbalanced when they refer to papers outside of the paper subfield or when they cite papers in interdisciplinary broad interest journals. So we tend to cite better when we cite inside our local fields, our local subfields, and when we cite outside our local subfield or when we cite um, the really high impact broad interest uh, journals, we tend to cite in a more imbalanced way. Number two, um, shorter reference lists are more imbalanced um, and longer reference lists are less imbalanced. So that's a very interesting correlation um, that could be, could be addressed with uh, interventions. And last, the author proportions in a journal are an important factor explaining citation disparities. So journals that publish a smaller fraction of papers authored by women also tend to have greater gender disparities in their reference lists. So what could we do about that? Number one, we can educate ourselves before citing far afield or citing generically. Number two, we could just cite more. And number three, journals could seek to publish more equitably. The final factor explaining citation disparities is um, that papers with a citation diversity statement are citing really differently. So a citation diversity statement is one in which the authors state clearly kind of near the data availability and code availability statement. There's a, there's a statement that says, you know, here we sought to um, uh, reflect our field fairly in the references that we chose to engage with in our introduction, in our discussion, in our results, in our methods, etc. Um, and often those citations diversity statements use publicly available software here, it's called CleanBib, that allows you to assess whether your references are citing close to the zero mark, um, so not over or under citing any particular group um, or not. And the papers that include this kind of statement are citing really close to the zero mark. So let me show you um, these data. The error bars here are for papers that don't include a citation diversity statement. So those are the ones that are oversighting man-man papers, for example, or papers undersighting papers from women. But the data points, these little gray data points here that you see, are the data from uh, papers that have a citation diversity statement. So you can see that they're all citing um, with zero uh, in their um, confidence intervals. So this is a really interesting factor um, that the field is using that seems to be having an impact on the way that we're citing. So um, broadening back out then and just leaving some time for questions, the citation gap is part of how we do science. So as building blocks of academic careers, the citation gap is about who does science or neuroscience and who gets to do neuroscience. It's also um, a building block of our field of inquiry. And as such, the, the citation gap is about our collective trajectories through the space of discovery. Of course, it's always more than the numbers. I showed you quantitative data, but we need to be asking more qualitative things too, like where and how we are citing. Are we sort of slapping references on at the end or engaging with them intellectually from the start? Are they in a long list at the end of a generic statement or alone supporting a specific claim? And are we citing equitably in all the other ways, like invitations, mentions, emails, retweets, et cetera? We can ask ourselves how we can lay down a new praxis for a science of tomorrow. So I think what I want you to take home from this lecture is to envision how we could use the lens that Rolf Clotter brought to um, neural systems and studying the pattern of connections between neural units and apply it now to how we do neuroscience together with one another. And by refocusing on the pattern of connections um, in the neural system of neuroscience, we can push the conceptual boundaries of how and by whom neuroscience is done. So with that, thank you so much for listening. I'd be glad to take questions.